Good afternoon, and welcome to the annual Eve Mayne Lecture, which this year is a special treat because it is the start of our 30th anniversary celebration for the Robert Schumann Center. My name is Eric Jones, and I share the unique distinction with two other people in this room uh, that I am director of the Robert Schumann Center, two previous directors, uh, Eve Mayne and Stefano Bartolini uh, are here to join us. I have to extend the very deep regrets of Bridget Laffin, whose plane was canceled at the last minute and so could not come along, and Helen Wallace, who also could not come along very unfortunately. These five people, the five directors of the Robert Schumann Center, are all following in Yves Mini's footsteps, footsteps. We have this annual lecture uh, because of the huge institution that these former directors have built. Uh, and we're celebrating it in a unique way this time by bringing in a speaker who was never a director of the Robert Schumann Center. <laughs> <clears throat> My job in introducing this uh, is, is simply threefold. First, Eve, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for all you've done. It's so great to celebrate this, and so much fun to work here. Second, Renault, 30 to 45 minutes. That's what Sarah told me. You can't go beyond that. <laughs> and third, everyone, please join me in thanking our joint chair in international history and capitalism, Glenda Sluga. Glenda's the only one we would ever trust with the responsibility for such an event. She will be chair and moderator throughout this conversation, and this is the last you will hear from me. So thank you very much. Well, I think one of the drawbacks, one of the drawbacks of being a president of even a research and teaching institute like the EUI is that your colleagues probably rarely ask you, what are you working on? What are you thinking about at the moment? And in fact, you know, Renaud uh, is and has always been the kind of president who is inclined to listen with a sympathetic ear and great interest uh, to his colleagues and the people he work with, asking them questions about what they're working on rather than talking about himself. Since assuming the presidency of the European University Institute in September 2016, he has characteristically been a president more concerned to promote the work of his colleagues than his own. So thank you for that. So given the short time we still have him with us, I think this might be a good time indeed to reflect on just how extensive Professor de Haas's work has been, his research and publications. So I'm going to expand on his career a little before we give him the floor. Uh, now, to begin with, I think he would be an excellent marketing example for the EUI since he began his illustrious uh, career here, studying for his doctorate in law at the EUI on the topic of federalism and international relations, uh, comparative uh, reflection. That was published in 1991 as a book. And since then, he's gone on to publish two other, uh, at least two other books on the de delegation of powers in the European Union, on the European Commission of the 21st century. If we asked him, what have you worked on, he might be likely to use keywords such as comparative federalism, the institutional evolution of the European Union, the eastern expansion of Europe, the results of the Maastricht Treaty, the transformation of governance of Europe at the European level, the role of the Court of Justice in the European political system. The European Union, the European Commission, crisis, hard and soft power in European governance. There are many papers and essays uh, that traverse these important questions. Many of these publications coincided with Professor de Harris's time as Jean Monnet Chair of European Law and Policy Studies at Sciences Po in Paris, where he founded and directed the Centre for European Studies. And even while president here, he has not in fact given up thinking and writing about many of these themes. And tonight he's returning to his overarching interest in the place of Europe in a Europe of nation states and the nation in Europe. But he won't be asked to revisit his own earlier work. Instead, Renault has given himself the task 
of launching his reflections through the work of Yves Mani, the man who preceded him uh, early in, as one of the earlier presidents of the EUI. Tonight's lecture is entitled De la Democratie Revisited, and I'm looking very forward very much to finding out more about how Professor de House, even as president, sees Europe through this lens. So please join in welcoming him to the lectern and asking him, Renaud, what are you working on? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, Eric, uh, for uh, the introduction. And above all, for uh, giving me the, the great pleasure, actually, to, to give a lecture at the EUI. It's a pleasure that I've been denied, as, uh, uh, <laughs> as Glenda uh, mentioned, uh, for uh, seven years now, uh, all, almost. So it's a, a great opportunity. And um, one could not dream of a better opportunity, actually, than this Eve Many annual lecture uh, to uh, basically return to the pulpit, uh, because uh, it gives me uh, an opportunity to pay a tribute to a scholar and uh, an academic leader uh, with, uh, with whom we have our path have intersected uh, on a great many occasions. I mean, we, we go back in time. Uh, uh, a great number of years. I won't tell you how many, but we are counting in decades, not in years, actually. And it's, um, therefore, for me, uh, a great uh, opportunity to highlight uh, what has been his contribution to uh, a number of issues that uh, are central uh, in the work of this institute, but also, uh, well, uh, very uh, important uh, in, in my own thinking. And I'm really think that one could not uh, think of a better way to kick off uh, the uh, celebrations for the 30th anniversary of the Robert Schumann Center, uh, an institution that has played a, a critical role in uh, the development of the Institute uh, in uh, its 30 years of existence. And I'm sure that uh, this is only a beginning. Now, having to return to the blackboard, so to say, I have decided to uh, return to, uh, well, a similar exercise uh, which had been asked uh, from me uh, some 20 years ago at the time he delivered uh, uh, the, German, uh, the Journal of Common Market Studies lecture entitled Democracy in Europe. And the reason for doing that is not uh, that it is, of course, very convenient uh, to, to have a solid uh, starting point but it, rather that uh, by returning to that lecture, I could see how uh, topical it still is today because it points at a number of uh, key developments in European uh, democratic systems which actually uh, shed light on uh, the developments uh, that we have witnessed in uh, the subsequent uh, two decades. And this is basically what I would like to illustrate. Now, the gist of Eve's analysis back in 2002 is to say, well, essentially that if uh, there is, there was already uh, dissatisfaction with democracy and people were already talking of disenchantment. Um, and in his view, this was to be connected to uh, the fact that democracies are typically more complex uh, than their uh, said to be in many popular descriptions of that political system. The reason being that uh, whereas, mm, let's say, the classical uh, reading emphasizes the, the popular element, the fact that we have a government uh, that rests on popular will somehow, it should not be ignored that democratic systems uh, also rest on a second leg. Uh, which is, well, uh, a constitutional leg, a, a leg in which uh, all sorts of uh, checks and balances have been uh, uh, introduced in order to prevent the so-called tyranny of the majority. Now, the interesting point is that back uh, in uh, 2002, it could already be said that the, the big... Uh, 
wave of democratization in the post-1945 period had been characterized by a strong consolidation, basically, of uh, that uh, second leg, which uh, consisted in the enactment of Bill of Rights, uh, the development of uh, uh, the creation of constitutional courts, and uh, uh, the development of judicial review, uh, uh, all phenomena uh, that had been uh, analyzed, by the way, uh, in the first decade of existence of this institute by uh, the great uh, Mauro Capelletti. Um, subsequently, one witnessed uh, uh, other constraints uh, developed uh, with uh, the emergence of uh, strong pillars of economic and social regulation, which further uh, reduced, in many respects, uh, the autonomy uh, left to uh, parliaments and governments, and therefore their ability to respond to uh, the concerns of uh, citizens of their respective countries. But the point, however, uh, that is made very clearly in uh, the lecture is that this well-known uh, phenomenon is to be, uh, let's say, supplemented by integrating into it a European dimension, uh, which has been often uh, wanting in analyses of uh, post-1945 uh, constitutional democracies. The point is that, uh, as is well known, uh, again, at the EUI, uh, European integration has often been integration through law. And this with, let's say, strong reasons, because the political objective of the European construction was basically to subject no longer governments but nation states to uh, all sorts of controls aimed at protecting higher values. This you see so well in so many areas where uh, Europe has found it necessary or appropriate to integrate, starting with human rights, of course, and the European Convention. But let me take an example which is perhaps more, uh, uh, let's say, surprising, which is that of the coal and steel community. What was the primary objective of the coal and steel community? To create a common market for coal and steel? No. That was not the objective. That was the instrument. The objective, as is stated very clearly in the Schuman Declaration, was of another kind a political objective by transferring, if you read the Schumann Declaration, it's all in full letters in, in that very short document. Why do we need to transfer control over coal and steel to an independent high authority uh, whose decision are to be binding on the members of uh, the new community? Well, this is simple, because the objective is to make war, I quote, not merely unthinkable, but materially impossible. So objective very clearly defined to restrict the range of things nation states and their four governments uh, therein can do. And somehow uh, you see in the history of European integrations many examples that illustrate the pervasiveness of this uh, integration through law mechanism. Now, what's the connection uh, with uh, democracy? Well, it's very simple. Uh, because integration rests on uh, the transfer of authority to uh, European institutions, which then develop a rule-based system, it ends up reducing the degree of autonomy enjoyed by governments, and uh, what uh, Peter, uh, Peter Mayer, uh, another uh, uh, great mind attached to this institute, has very well described as the policy space, that is to say the area uh, of choice open to uh, governments and legislatures in a number of uh, uh, areas. That's, uh, I think, a key to understand why so much attention has been uh, devoted through time to the concept of uh, uh, democratic deficit. Now, 
It's interesting to note that in his uh, 2002 lecture, uh, Eve explains very well the emergence uh, of uh, the interest for that concept, but offers, also offers a very severe critique of the discourse that has accompanied uh, the development of this kind of thinking. Critique uh, linked to the vagueness uh, of the concept, to the fact that uh, basically it is based on an idealized vision of national democracies as if uh, uh, constitutional constraints did not exist in those political systems. Uh, a critique also based on uh, what I would call the level of analysis problem, that is to say the fact that the EU, we don't know yet what the EU will be, uh, but we know that for the time being it is a transnational union of states and not a nation state. And therefore it is uh, probably a fallacy to think that uh, you can simply transpose from uh, the national to the European level tools and instruments that have been uh, developed in order to ensure the democratic character of uh, the political system at the national level. So a clear nexus uh, between uh, the European and uh, the national level, which basically makes uh, the invention of uh, EU democracy uh, a very challenging exercise. Uh, an exercise in which the lecture offers us a series of, uh, for which the lecture offers us a series of recommendations which remain extremely uh, timely, I think. First, the fact that uh, mimicry is not sufficient. We have to invent new tools uh, responding to new paradigms. Second, that it is advisable, given precisely the, uh, the character of the difficulty, that uh, one follows a kind of incremental approach in which uh, one tries uh, new uh, um, instruments and explores uh, new uh, possibilities of consolidating the democratic character of the EU. And uh, finally, an invitation to humility because with all due respect for institutional engineering, it is quite clear that uh, democracy is one thing, legitimacy is another one. And you may perfectly uh, envisage, and we could quote many examples of that, uh, a system in which you have a perfectly democratic uh, government taking decisions that are con considered as illegitimate uh, politically, if not legally, by a majority of the public, which is, of course, uh, a mighty problem. So, follows from all this that uh, if the EU is to be made democratic, uh, which is not uh, contested uh, by uh, Eve in his lecture, then it will have to, to be inventive, basically, and, and to come up with uh, innovations. Now, allow me to stop just a minute to say that uh, it's important in relation to that analysis to, well, to uh, remind us of the historical context in which it has taken place. The lecture was delivered uh, in April 2002 uh, at a time where, well, populism was not an unknown concept. Indeed, Eve had devoted a book <laughs> to it uh, a couple of years before. Um, but it, it certainly was, uh, populism as a political phenomenon was certainly not as developed as it is today. Um, you had... Um, Yes, a number of parties labeled by, uh, labeled by observers as populist, but they were uh, considered as you know, having a marginal uh, influence at best. I mean, uh, uh, the two Finns uh, I looked had only member, one member of parliament at the time. Uh, Front National in France did not have any. Uh, Alternative für Deutschland did not exist, and so on and so forth. And young uh, Giorgia Meloni at the time was active in the youth movement of Alleanza Nazionale, a party which had been built in order to, let's say, assist in a shift of the far right towards the center, 
which is interesting to remember in uh, the present time Italy. So we were in a context where basically uh, the, the kind of situation uh, we now know uh, was only at the beginning. And yet it happened very quickly. Only 10 days after uh, the lecture was delivered, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen made it to the second round of uh, the uh, French presidential election, which, of course, was a, a terrible uh, shock to uh, the French uh, political system. And, by the way, on uh, that same day, uh, a, a tall blonde lady uh, acquired instant notoriety on, uh, uh, in a number of TV shows, uh, the tall lady in question, made the first page of Italian newspapers uh, because of her presence in Pontida yesterday. So I think you know who I'm referring to. The point is that we have now uh, to see how the uh, matrix provided in Eve's 2002 lecture has uh, basically uh, may help us in uh, reading uh, the developments that uh, have followed. And to be short, I would say that it stands remarkably well, because many of the things that, uh, uh, of the problems that were discerned uh, in that lecture have gained a, a lot of, uh, have only gained in acuteness uh, in the following years. Now, I'll cover very quickly uh, Really three of the four uh, developments mentioned uh, on that slide, because I think they illustrate uh, very well the, the salient points of the period. Uh, everybody knows that, yes, there has been a, a real populist tide in, in the last two decades, and it's not over, far from it. Um, what we did not expect, it, uh, because of uh, the uh, integration fatigue uh, that uh, was said to exist uh, at the time the lecture was delivered, was uh, that uh, there would be very significant transfers of authority to the EU level, and uh, an interesting phenomenon of uh, Europeanization of domestic politics, uh, uh, which, of course, uh, also resulted in pushback, and notably uh, in uh, a number of attacks on constitutionalism, both at the national and at the European level. As said, there's no time to uh, talk about populism in any way. There are in the rooms many people who are much more qualified than I am to uh, basically analyze the phenomenon, so I won't bring the call to Newcastle. Let me perhaps uh, focus on what is, for me, the the main puzzle uh, of that period, uh, because I repeat, the rest could be anticipated, that uh, I find more difficult uh, to uh, imagine. Uh, the main puzzle is that, uh, as I hinted, we have witnessed uh, in uh, the ensuing period, in response to a long series of multiple crises, to uh, significant transfers of authority at the EU level. Uh, which, A, no uh, government was really in favor of uh, and certainly were not uh, de demanded by uh, public opinion at large, and which, also interestingly, the theorizing about uh, integrations uh, would have led us not to expect, and I refer here to uh, a very... Uh, acute and influential uh, work uh, by uh, Lisbeth Hogg and Gary Marx, who are still, I think, attached to the Robert Schuman Center, uh, in which uh, they claimed that because of the saliency acquired by uh, European uh, issues in uh, domestic uh, political systems and uh, um, the, the growing opposition to, to integration, it was very unlikely that any functionalist pressure would be sufficient to uh, generate further integration. Well, as we shall see, uh, the situation has been uh, a bit different from what uh, we actually, all of us, uh, would have expected at that time. Now, I can't uh, summarize uh, those developments in uh, only uh, five minutes. Uh, so I I'll simply say that what is important uh, to note is that 
yes, uh, the multiple crises I refer to uh, have all generated uh, in multiple ways pressures for transfers of authority to uh, the European level, but in a number of different ways. The outputs were different. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, crisis resulted in a transfer of authority to supranational institutions, uh, such as in uh, banking union, for instance, which was really unexpected. Uh, in other areas, uh, the crisis did not generate any uh, significant change. And here, uh, the best example is, of course, uh, again on the front page of today's newspapers, migration policy. Yes, there was a lot of hot air on migration policy, but uh, uh, it cannot be said that uh, the European response has been characterized by a, uh, by a, a significant transfer of authority to the European level, and B, by any kind, uh, any uh, particular effectiveness in uh, that area, hence uh, the dire situation in which we find ourselves today. The same variety uh, as regards policy instruments, uh, you have good old-fashioned uh, transfer of authority to independent bodies such as the commission of the ECB, but also the, the creation of entirely new regulatory frameworks and, and new instruments such as uh, the very original uh, system that was created to uh, uh, launch uh, next generation EU to take but one example. I don't have time to dwell on these examples, but I think uh, they are sufficiently well known to illustrate my point, which is that we have a remarkable diversity of patterns of integration, which means that basically it's very difficult to uh, explain with one single uh, analytical, uh, let alone theoretical instrument. And uh, just to illustrate this point, I would say that uh, building with a toolbox uh, that you can find in uh, Lisbeth and Gary's two and, um, 2009 article, I would say that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, constraining the census, which they announced, uh, uh, did not always materialize far from it. Uh, but we witnessed the emergence of uh, interesting alternatives, such as enabling consensus, by which I describe a situation in which, despite the polarization between uh, uh, the various uh, political uh, systems on a number of issues, governments, I would almost say despite their public opinion, found it necessary to agree on emergency measures that were necessary in order to ensure essential public goods. And with a clear uh, understanding that the failure to do so could have had uh, dramatic consequences. Remember uh, the 2008-9 period in which it was said that uh, the euro was bound to fail and was about to disappear. Uh, remember uh, the situation in which we found ourselves uh, at, uh, uh, in the middle of the pandemic where uh, it appeared that uh, a consortium of uh, large countries was already moving in order to uh, acquire for themselves vaccines, uh, whereas uh, the destiny of uh, smaller countries uh, seemed to be uh, more difficult to, to predict. All this for a virus which, of course, uh, uh, largely omitted the existence of uh, national borders. Another interesting type uh, and uh, really more puzzling type of uh, situation, but I think it's a characterization that uh, helps us to understand uh, what happened, is the idea of what I labeled uh, an enabling dissensus, where actually the very raison d'etre for Europeanization of uh, a number of uh, decision-making powers was the fact that governments had different views. And on top of that, that they did not trust one another. Here, of course, uh, a telling example is that of banking union. It's not because uh, enlightened statements said, oh, the time has come after uh, monetary union to endow the EU of the capacity to regulate uh, a banking system which had become largely transnational. No, 
It's more or less the opposite. We had, on the one hand, countries that massively, uh, or rather uh, uh, strongly needed uh, uh, the support and the guarantee in particular of uh, the union and credit to countries, and credit to countries which really uh, did not trust their counterparts in other countries. And uh, the net result of all this was to say that the best, or perhaps uh, uh, not nobody's favorite solution, but certainly the, uh, the best solution uh, in, in that uh, kind of situation was to delegate regulatory and control powers to an independent empire, in that very case, the European Central Bank. Uh, so a delegation of powers to an independent body justified by the fact that basically uh, the principles, the member states, did not trust one another. And this, of course, uh, uh, echoes a bit what has taken place in earlier years in other areas. I mean, Pascal Lamy uh, once uh, very uh, concisely summarized this uh, by uh, referring to the Commission's role as that of a réducteur de méfiance, uh, namely uh, an institution whose existence is justified by the fact that it is important, indispensable actually, to reduce the, members, uh, the, uh, the mistress uh, that characterizes the relationship between the member states in uh, several areas. And I also uh, uh, refer here to uh, Hermann van Rompuy's remark on uh, banking union, actually, where he said, why did we entrust uh, so much power to the ECB? Well, because that's the only way we know in the EU system to depoliticize a process, which, we, which is what we have to do in, ta in case of a clash between national preferences. We have to communitarize decision in that area. Now, all of this may be explained, uh, probably, as I'm trying to do. Uh, but the net result of all this is, of course, uh, somewhat perplexing in uh, a reflection on uh, democracy, because none of this is based on any democratic input of any kind. Um, and the interesting thing is that when one tried to counterbalance uh, some of those decisions by uh, an appeal to uh, national sovereignty and the people's will, well, uh, it failed. And the most uh, blatant example being, of course, the uh, referendum called by uh, the Greek government in 2015 uh, in between two uh, meetings of uh, the European Council to, well, get a mandate to reject a plan which led to an even stricter plan uh, being adopted, a good illustration of the, let's say, relatively weak, and that's an understatement, uh, uh, democratic endorsement of uh, that type of policy shift. Second element uh, which uh, I think is uh, to be noted when thinking about uh, the last two decades is uh, what I would call the Europeanization of domestic politics. Now, uh, you may remember uh, that Europeanization was a very popular concept uh, uh, two decades ago. Uh, but then uh, it was so widely used and, and misused that we were invited to caution, notably uh, by uh, our colleague Claudio Radaelli, uh, because uh, it, it would lose part of its explaining power. I'm using it. Uh, this notwithstanding uh, today, because I think it helps us uh, characterize what I see as an important aspect of uh, the post-2002 uh, 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 developments. Basically, the fact that uh, in European countries, uh, there is, in uh, electoral contest, uh, a growing importance of Europeanized issues. Now, uh, what do I mean by this, uh, uh, by this uh, neologism? I simply mean that uh, in the classical literature on, uh, uh, let's say, uh, attitudes toward European integration, the, let's say, indicator of interest for European things is uh, 
very heavily on what Stefano Bartolini has called constitutive issues, namely, what importance do you attach to uh, the development of the European Union as a political construction? Uh, I think that uh, this could be useful in the early years, but it is uh, no longer sufficient to understand the current situation. The current situation is one in which, notably because of its uh, importance in uh, relation to uh, fiscal policy, the EU is perceived as having an impact, even in areas in which it does not necessarily have much to say. Think of the reform of health systems. How many times, in how many countries have we heard uh, that it was because of Europe that one had to increase pension age uh, or uh, uh, reduce, in other manners, the investment that our societies make in uh, that part of their welfare system. And actually, it's not that you had clear uh, EU guidelines on that topic. But yes, uh, the, the fact that governments have to balance their budget, uh, particularly where, when they are in the Eurozone, has, of course, a, a strong impact over their ability to spend money and therefore deal with the welfare system, education system, unemployment, education in general, or even migrations, all issues which are not, uh, strictly speaking, uh, European issues uh, in the sense that uh, the competence would have been transferred to the European level. And yet, those are the big issues uh, in uh, political context at uh, contest at the domestic level, which uh, explains why, yes, uh, uh, the, the looming shadow of Europe uh, has acquired a great importance. And you see more and more domestic parties, even at the time of national elections, using, let's say, their uh, views on Europe as an argument uh, in uh, the political contest first element. Secondly, in most cases, they do it in a negative fashion. It's by opposing yourself uh, to Europe that you make yourself a name and uh, then gain ground in uh, political elections. And there the examples are so many uh, uh, that uh, I will spare you the list. I think uh, uh, you certainly have them as clearly in mind as I do myself. The point is that uh, this trend is so strong that uh, they are not merely uh, a feature of populist forces, but even mainstream parties uh, very often find it very convenient to explain that Europe is wrong, that they have uh, to basically uh, uh, push in order to change it and uh, reverse the course of integration. I mean, many leaders of mainstream parties uh, had... Uh, have found it very convenient to rely on, on that kind of uh, approach. Um, I can mention two names, but again, there are many more. Uh, somebody like Matteo Renzi in this country was a, a real champion. Uh, but Nicolas Sarkozy also uh, uh, was not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, afraid of using to that kind of rhetoric to show how strong uh, a defender of the national interest he was. And by the way, this echoes uh, one uh, theme in Eve's uh, book on populism, uh, in which uh, it was shown that uh, populism was not merely a feature of populist parties, but uh, uh, a technique used uh, by a never larger number of people, even in uh, so-called mainstream parties. So Europeanization of domestic politics, uh, a phenomenon that actually uh, translates into a form of negative integration. It's by opposing to Europe that you assert yourself. Yes, uh, it, makes, uh, it results in a more Europeanized landscape, but it's exactly, if you think of it, the reverse of what uh, Jürgen Habermas had uh, called for at the time of the debate on the European Constitution, that is to say, not a strong, growing support for uh, integration, but in contrast, uh, an ever stronger opposition to integration. So 
in the face of this, of course, the big question is how come uh, we have witnessed in this period so many transfers of authority to the European level? And I mentioned just uh, quickly uh, the fact that, as it was to be expected, the, the period also was characterized by uh, uh, systematic attacks on uh, the constitutional features both of uh, the domestic and the European systems. That makes a lot of sense given uh, uh, the uh, analysis uh, that uh, was developed by Eve uh, in his uh, 2002 lecture. Let me then try to finish with uh, um, some attempts at uh, explaining what made it possible, despite uh, the growing opposition to Europe that we witnessed in uh, um, so many countries uh, and in uh, so many situations, um, that we had uh, such a massive transfer of authority to the European level. Um, here, I want to point at two structural uh, elements which I think uh, have some explanatory powers, but this is only a partial explanation. The first one is that uh, the EU system uh, is and remains a system of decision making by consensus. This uh, graph that you see uh, on the screen uh, is, I think, quite telling in that respect because it gives uh, the number uh, of, or rather the percentage uh, of EU decisions uh, adopted day after day, uh, year after year, uh, without a vote, a formal vote in the Council of Ministers. And you see that, yes, we had enlargement in 2004, but it, it didn't change anything in that respect. Yes, we had a succession of crises uh, starting in 2008, but again, uh, no uh, no clear impact on the system. The only impact that you can discern is actually something of an artifact. That's the situation for years uh, 2018 and 2019, which is when uh, actually the uh, UK government, because it was preparing to withdraw from the EU, decided that it would systematically abstain in uh, all uh, legislative procedures, whatever the topic, basically which, of course, resulted in a mechanical uh, lowering of the percentage. But had uh, London opted for a different policy, I think the, uh, the, line, the dotted line would have been perfectly uh, flat. Even more telling is uh, the situation in the European Parliament. A parliament is a place where political parties of so many different types uh, are represented, uh, and therefore you would expect a, a greater polarization and uh, a more divided parliament. And yet, what you see there on the screen is uh, the percentage, the average percentage of positive votes in the European Parliament for the final vote on uh, pieces of legislation adopted at the EU level. And you see that the average is 90, uh, an amazing 90% of uh, positive votes. Uh, even uh, after uh, uh, the growth of uh, populist uh, represent parties' representation in the European Parliament. Now, I'm not saying that all of this is positive, uh, notably because uh, it has an impact both on, on the time it takes to decide and on uh, the Union's ability to effectively decide, uh, because achieving consensus is difficult. But the point is that, yeah, consensus remains uh, a hallmark uh, of that system, and that may explain why, uh, when uh, there were transfers of authority, they were not uh, resented as too intrusive by uh, uh, the governments of EU member countries. What is also interesting is that I would argue, uh, even though it sort of uh, may seem as uh, in contradiction with uh, the point I just made, that uh, the European uh, political system has gradually uh, become more responsive uh, indirectly to uh, 
citizens' concerns and preferences. Through what kind of mechanism? Well, Eve had invited us uh, to be uh, innovative when thinking about democracy. It seems that uh, his call uh, was heard by a, a number of people, uh, key actors in the European uh, party system, when they launched uh, the uh, so-called Spitzenkandidaten system. What's uh, the nexus? Well, the nexus is very simple. Uh, typically, uh, in uh, discussions about uh, the, the system of lead candidates, people emphasize one aspect, which is the idea that uh, uh, the system in question, by uh, enabling uh, citizens to vote for uh, uh, members of parliament, would indirectly uh, enable them to express a preference for who should be uh, the leader of the forthcoming European Commission. That's the, let's say, the, uh, the simplistic reading of uh, the Spitzenkandidaten system. But there's another, more interesting, I think, aspect uh, linked to that proposal, which is the agenda-setting aspect. The fact that uh, the, the idea is not merely to choose the next commission president, but also to Europeanize electoral debates by having people running for election, addressing European rather than national issues, which they did in uh, uh, the two campaigns in which uh, the system was uh, tried. Now, that's interesting because it enables uh, voters no longer to talk about people, but to talk about issues. What are the most important issues that Europe uh, should address in the forthcoming legislature? And if you accept this uh, twofold characterization of the system, then I think the vision uh, we can have of the Spitzenkandidaten system and its uh, uh, relative success uh, may change. Um, everybody agrees that it worked in 2014 because A, Jean-Claude Juncker was, uh, became commission president, simply said because the European Parliament had it its way, and um, because if you look at uh, his commission's priorities, you would see that they largely follow uh, his platform uh, at the time he was a candidate. Now, we are told that the system did not work in 2019 because none of the so-called Spitzenkandidaten was uh, selected to become the commission president, uh, uh, the latter being parachuted uh, uh, from uh, Berlin uh, by, uh, with a strong agency of the French president. Well, that, I think, is a superficial analysis. Uh, firstly, you, you might note that uh, whoever, who became president of the commission was a member of the party that had the largest number of seats in the European Parliament after the election. So it's not entirely incompatible uh, with, uh, let's say, the, uh, the principle uh, underlying uh, the system. But more importantly uh, for me is the fact that uh, what did Ursula von der Leyen do when she landed in Brussels uh, and was given a week uh, to come up with a program uh, that uh, she would defend before the European Parliament. Well, unsurprisingly, she toured uh, the European uh, Parliament uh, parties in order to hear what they had to say. And unsurprisingly, too, uh, you can notice that uh, the issue that became number one uh, on her platform as Commission President happened uh, to be uh, the creation, uh, the launching of a European Green Deal, which, strange as it may seem, perfectly coincides with the fact that on that occasion there had been a clear shift to uh, Green parties at uh, uh, the time of uh, the election. So you can say that, okay, the personalization aspect of the system did not work in 2019, but the programmatic one, the agenda-setting one, did work. And that is important because it may create a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, a loop in which citizens not only pass judgment of the performance of the outgoing commission, but have, with the European election, 
the opportunity to play some kind of agenda setting role. And in a system of that kind, then, yes, you may say, uh, elements of uh, democratic legitimation uh, are indeed perhaps in uh, the making, but of course we'll know more uh, after uh, the next elections. So, I think I have uh, greatly exceeded my time, so uh, I bring this to an end simply uh, by saying that uh, through this uh, little journey uh, in uh, the post-2002 uh, uh, developments, uh, I wanted to show how strong the analytical uh, scheme that was put forward by Eve uh, was, uh, uh, and indeed how helpful it is in order to not only make sense of what we have witnessed so far, but also try to anticipate what may happen in the future. Um, we need, of course, uh, to remain humble uh, and accept that uh, uh, with, uh, despite these interesting innovations that we have witnessed at the European level, there is a lot more that needs to be done if we really want to argue that the system as uh, it is, is uh, democratic. But I'm not pessimistic. I think precisely you may read the recent developments and indication of the fact that uh, despite being contested, or perhaps because it is contested, the EU has uh, demonstrated a remarkable ability, the EU and its member states, by the way, because uh, I don't mean that the system originates in Brussels, but the remarkable ability to innovate and, and has proved very uh, resilient in, uh, in doing so. So um, at least uh, there are reasons to hope that that process will not stop. And my last word uh, will be to say that uh, going back to uh, those developments, uh, one can but be impressed by the fact that uh, the EUI contribution to the analysis of uh, the multiple uh, phenomena that, that I have just uh, been uh, superficially describing uh, today has been really both uh, important in size and important in uh, uh, analytical uh, quality. And uh, um, of course, that's the best way, one can think, uh, to celebrate uh, the 30th anniversary of the Robert Schumann Center, which has been a key actor uh, in uh, that process. Uh, and I will end by uh, a simple request, which is that uh, perhaps the Institute itself uh, should devote uh, a little attention to that phenomenon, that is to say, to uh, keeping track of the intellectual history of those debates, because uh, Having had the uh, pleasure of uh, defending the Institute in a number of uh, circles, uh, I think it would be a great asset if we could show, in relation to a number of topics, how important uh, uh, its contribution has been to the analysis of European developments. But I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience, uh, and uh, thanks again, Yves, uh, for your contribution. much um, for you know a characteristically generous intellectually generous overview and um, lots of provocative and interesting ideas there and I know we have I've been fielding questions already on my phone and and we have some from the audience I think so if you'd like to ask a question um, uh, Yelena Junkic and maybe we get a microphone over there and uh, if you introduce yourself before asking a question Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jelena Jankic and I'm part-time professor here at the Schumann Center directing the research area on Southeastern Europe and co-directing the area on global citizenship. So this goes along my direction in two ways. Thank you so much, President Dehus, for uh, this fascinating talk. And I think it's really important to look at the past, to understand the present and think about the future, and especially in the context of um, the future of um, European democracy. Now, I wanted to ask you uh, a question, which is kind of builds on your conclusions here. 
So given that the national democratic landscapes across the EU are so uneven, and that this is largely a result of the authority transfer on one end, but also of the Europeanization of domestic politics, which you have also mentioned in the talk on the other, how can we make these different national democratic landscapes work together to create a European democratic whole? So in a way, can the sum be larger than the parts that form it? Okay, well, that's, uh, I think, a 64,000 euro question uh, in the sense that uh, you're making it even more difficult, I believe, than the classical democratic deficit uh, issue uh, where people simply uh, focus on the, or mainly focus on the European level. But I think you have a point. It is indeed important for... Uh, the debates that take place uh, uh, at the domestic level to be somehow interconnected. I think we see something moving. I, I, I can't really say that it is happening. But I refer to uh, Marine Le Pen. It, it's interesting to notice that yesterday uh, we had Marine Le Pen in Pontida and Ursula von der Leyen in uh, Lampedusa. Uh, which is a, a very nice example of uh, the kind of multi-level politics that uh, we increasingly witness, where people are seeking allies in other countries. And, of course, what is at stake in Salvini's invitation is also uh, uh, the question of uh, the groups, parliamentary groups in which uh, the... Um, uh, let's say the right-wing populist parties will find themselves, you know, that uh, they are to be found in three different groups, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, the question is, will they unite or not? And it's not neutral on the, the domestic scene. Whereas uh, in, in the case of, uh, let's say, the great uh, complicity uh, displayed by uh, Ursula von der Leyen and uh, Georgia Meloni, there are other issues at stake, uh, notably uh, uh, the question of uh, a would-be uh, second mandate for uh, the president of the commission. So if I were to say what may encourage uh, uh, this kind of development, I would say the fact that we are increasingly, we, we, are, we are increasingly in a multi-level system, that much we know, but interestingly, Political actors now seem to realize it. And uh, a big issue of uh, the forthcoming uh, uh, electoral campaign in Italy is clearly uh, how the parties in government will uh, conduct their campaign and how they will instrumentalize their relationship to Europe in order to gain ground with respect to uh, their, uh, uh, their biggest rival, who happens to be in the same majority. Yeah, thank you. Thorsten Beck, um, Director of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. Um, I'm an economist, so I want to say this right away because this kind of informs my comment and question. Um, do you talk about two legs here, um, democratic participation, but then also, of course also constitutional constraints being put up, up on the European level? If I want to kind of introduce a third leg, um, financial markets and all the threats by financial markets. I mean, if you think, um, and kind of just, again, historic view, um, early 80s, uh, Mitterrand, François Mitterrand, um, kind of very expansionary policies, took three years, ultimately for him to change course. Uh, fall 2022, Liz Truss, UK, um, it took like a, a week or so to return, to revert to a more kind of a reasonable, sensible macroeconomic policy, I would say. So, or similarly, if you go back to what you mentioned earlier, 2015 in Greece, I mean, it was just not just between the will of the people, as, as stated in the referendum, and what the uh, creditor countries effectively, the Troika was asking, but there were, of course, also the markets threatening, right? And there were some, not me, but some economists who said, well, let's just crash them out, and then let's see what happens. So is it also that because this European um, integration process also involves kind of not replacing, but complementing markets 
with more stronger government action, especially over the last 10 years or so, much more interventionism, but also protectionism ultimately for societies. Does it also explain partly why, as you pointed out, that there hasn't been this complete backlash and the, the, the integration hasn't really reverted or hasn't failed quite yet? Thanks. Well, uh, there's a lot uh, <laughs> in your comment, Dustin. Uh, Nobody, and certainly not me, will challenge you on the importance of financial markets. Uh, indeed, the two examples you uh, mentioned uh, are telling. Uh, it's, it's, of course, remarkable that uh, uh, the uh, spectacular uh, uh, explosion of uh, Liz Truss uh, cabinet and policy took place mm. at the time Giorgia Meloni was indeed uh, com com coming to power because I think she got an instant a crash course on what could happen to her if she deviated too much from uh, the orthodoxy that is required. So, uh, of course, financial markets are a constraint. Uh, now, <laughs> whereas you could argue that checks and balances are part and parcel of a democratic system to protect uh, minorities against the majority. I find it a bit more difficult to argue that financial markets would play the same kind of role. But I don't think that this is what you meant. So uh, I think we do agree uh, in a nutshell. Hi, thank you so much for this inspiring speech, uh, Yasminka Kaufman from uh, University of Zagreb, Jan Monet Fellow here. So I, I'm going to ask a very radical question, I think, of, to start off. Is your, the process of Europeanization dead? Um, and, and maybe a more uh, sophisticated question. Are um, supranational rules and processes still capable of transforming national landscapes? So you were referring, I think, to the process of Europeanization in Central Eastern Europe, and, and my field of interest is competition law and competition culture. So my research shows that really the, the question is how adequate is this transfer, uh, the, legal, uh, the transfer of legal rules in, in uh, Central Eastern Europe. If you look at trade association um, as uh, collusion, institutional collusion points uh, still being there, and then uh, how adequate are our antitrust rules in, in tackling these problems? So I think this comes back to what you're referring to, democracy and, and shared values. So I think um, the, the question I, I want to ask is, um, how, what, what is the pos potential of competition, antitrust rules, to make sure that they support democracy and market values uh, that are linked to, to, to this? Thank you. Well. Here I must say, uh, you're the expert, I'm not. Um, and I think that it would be, well, it's important, I think, to accept that uh, not everything the EU does is, uh, let's say, uh, motivated by uh, concerns for democracy. We know that it has a, it has a, a standard model for competition policy, uh, and asterisk rules that one may like or dislike, uh, that, that is often blamed uh, in uh, one of my countries, for instance. Uh, but I don't think it's justified by democratic concerns. Uh, you place the bar very high, and maybe you're right in doing so, uh, in the sense that uh, at, the, at the end of the day, we, we want, uh, we should, in a democratic system, um, accept the idea that uh, there is a form of democratic legitimation for all the rules uh, that are imposed. Now, uh, as you know, uh, for a great many rules, uh, this is not, that uh, democratic basis is not the will of parliament or the choice of voters uh, directly expressed uh, uh, in election or in referenda. It's, let's say, at the time of a uh, constitutional decision uh, that uh, one identifies uh, the uh, democratic legitimation for a number of uh, constitutional choices. Now, 
I'm not saying that all that the EU does is justified by the fact that uh, in uh, adhesion referenda, uh, the population of uh, the uh, Eastern European countries have adopted uh, or, or approved rather the adhesion and, and the 80 pages, the 80,000 pages of uh, the so-called acquis communautaire. That would be a bit easy as an answer. But you see what I mean? I don't think we can, at least I cannot, think of a direct legitimation for that kind of rule. We must accept that uh, there are uh, constitutional compromises that may, of course, be revisited. And arguably, this is what the UK has done uh, uh, by saying, no, uh, rightly or wrongly, we are not happy uh, with uh, the present setup. Therefore, therefore we will leave. Uh, that's uh, one way uh, to uh, present us, to characterize the situation that uh, allows us to say, well, uh, they, they had the democratic possibility to opt out, and, and they grabbed it. Uh, I'm not saying that it should be, uh, that any problem should be presented in such a dramatic uh, fashion, because, of course, uh, it, it would uh, be extremely detrimental to the overall stability of the EU, but the uh, seems to me that in terms of constitutional legitimacy, uh, this is, uh, for the moment, uh, the best uh, form of legitimation that we have. I don't see how uh, the essence of competition policy is precisely to be kept at harm's length of, uh, of politics. Uh, that's at least uh, what uh, I learned as a student of antitrust. Uh, I think it, it remains valid, but I repeat, uh, you're the expert and I will be delighted to hear more about uh, uh, your uh, contribution to that topic. Um, Olivier Roy, part-time professor. Uh, a big word in Brussels, you know, in the European Parliament is European values. And if I am not mistaken, you didn't mention the, the term values uh, in your lecture. Probably it was safer, but uh, um, it's yeah. another story. Uh, does it mean that uh, you consider that the dissensus uh, on values can be managed, you know, uh, by managing a, a variety of uh, opinions, views, etc.? Or do you consider that, in fact, there are two Europes, or more exactly, only one Europe, uh, based on the so-called European values, and the other being not really part of this uh, 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 value-based Europe? Yeah, again, uh, a, a tricky question. And you're right, I, 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 uh, I don't think I mentioned values, and that was deliberate. <laughs> because uh, my approach was more, let's say, of an engineering type. But of course, uh, behind constitutionalism lie very strong values. Now, are these the only values that can and should be considered? No, I don't think so. And indeed, uh, uh, by uh, uh, adopting um, a declaration, uh, a Charter of Fundamental Rights, the European Union has claimed a role in uh, uh, so many uh, debates uh, related to values. So, uh, it follows that it is bound to be increasingly criticized uh, for uh, what it does or what it fails to do. Uh, which is why, if you ask me, uh, and for the sake of uh, consistency, I was not a great fan of the idea of a Charter of Fundamental Rights. I thought that it would expose the weak European structure resting on uh, a loose consensus on a number of core principles to a series of, uh, a long list of uh, uh, formidable challenges, because we see now how many, uh, I mean, how polarized our societies are becoming around some issues over which, which are not prima facie directly related to, let's say, the core EU policies, but unavoidably will end up uh, uh, cutting across those. So for me, that's a source of uh, concern. and. Uh, I'm not sure it's, it, was wise, uh, it was a wise choice to expand the list of uh, 
values on which the construction was based. I don't think this uh, process has strengthened the EU, on the contrary. <clears throat> Calypso Nicolaitis from the STG. Um, uh, Renaud, you, you stressed, uh, thankfully very much, Eve's uh, insistence on the need for inventiveness, and I must testify as co-convener of our EUI transnational democracy cluster, a concept you, you invented for uh, EUI with, with Philippe Costelva, I can testify to the great uh, richness, really, of research of all our colleagues interested in democracy to this day in thinking through this inventiveness. And, um, and this leads me to this, the, the question, which, which I pick up from your, when you said, well, not everything the EU does is motivated by democracy. And that's interesting because um, from, you highlight a number of tensions that lead us to think, well, yeah, democracy is great, it's important in the eyes of the citizens, but there are some trade-offs. And, and I wanted to ask, is it, aren't we falling short in the eyes of citizens because we insist, because actually these trade-offs are, are, are much more, um, are much less trade-offs than we think. So let me give two examples. Responsiveness and effectiveness. Uh, we spoke a lot about financial um, governance. I would submit that if the next-gen EU distribution, including in this country, was much more radically transparent, and transparency is the core of democracy, you know, it, the funds would be much more effectively spent, less, less corruption, more collective intelligence, etc. Um, and so, yeah, and we've had a number of meetings here at the UI trying to think this through. The Commission says, well, we have spreadsheets, but this is not really what we believe is, is transparency. And the second is, um, uh, you refer to the tension between responsiveness and consensus. Um, and that may be true when we think of consensus in the dark rooms of the Council. But a lot of the democratic innovation that we're seeing now with citizen assemblies and citizens audit, etc., show that the more you put citizens together, you know, horizontally, the more in very, very short times are, do they learn to do consensus among themselves. Do they really converge to a mean of opinions? And so there is much, much more potential for seeking to ground this consensus among the population if we really involve and engage citizens uh, in Europe today. At least that's what um, the hypothesis we, we are exploring. Well, Calypso, I think that your comment illustrate, I think, a, a difference between you and I, in the sense that I was trying to be analytical. You're a bit more normative. I'm not blaming you for that. But simply, our two discourses are not exactly uh, uh, at the same level. That said, um, I think you are right, of course, uh, and that there is no, let's say, iron law that would make it impossible for a, a system of decision making by consensus to be a, at the same time somehow responsive. But I think you will recognize that uh, it, it places the bar very high uh, because indeed deciding in the first place is difficult. Uh, and uh, the, the chances are that uh, in, in many instances there simply will be no decision because of the consensus requirement. Well, well, typically in migration policy this is what happened. And uh, it's made all the more interesting by the fact that uh, the instruments were there. If I remember well in 2015 uh, at uh, or following uh, the, the big migrant wave, there was already a decision on relocation. It was uh, made uh, compulsory uh, because it was enshrined uh, in uh, a regulation that was voted uh, against uh, a minority of uh, countries, Visegrad countries, not to name them, and then not implemented, which shows at the same time how 
uh, strong the, democ uh, the consensus uh, legitimation of the system is. But why was it not implemented? Because people said, yes, we recognize that all the conditions set by the treaty are, uh, have been fulfilled. Nobody uh, questions uh, the, the regularity of the vote. But there is such a strong polarization that implementing that decision would uh, probably uh, be uh, extremely damaging for the authority of the Union because there would be resistance and so on and so forth. So um, I agree that on paper uh, th there is not a complete antagonism between the two. Uh, I nonetheless believe that uh, uh, they are very uh, difficult to effectively uh, reconcile. But uh, let's say, uh, as a citizen, I hope you're right, uh, and that uh, indeed uh, astute engineers will be able to uh, uh, achieve this uh, small miracle of uh, a consensus that effectively responds to the will of a uh, majority or large number, at least, uh, uh, of uh, EU uh, citizens. But that's not easy. So we have at least five more questions. So I think I'll group them a bit. We'll do two and then three. So we have a question at the back, and then if you hand yours over to the gentleman you see on the aisle. Okay. No, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, Marco Buti, I'm uh, holding the Tommaso Padua Schiopo chair here. I was at the Commission uh, till last April, and um, during the van der Leyen Commission, we used Article 122, if I'm not mistaken, about 15 times. Article 122 is the one, uh, the article that allows to take a uh, decision under emergency. Um, now, the good side is that it works. Hmm? It has allowed to take very important decision, vaccines, next generation you just to mention um, two examples but there are many others also during the energy crisis it works also because by not creating permanent competencies in a sense allows the member state to be more relaxed because they know they can stop at any moment mm -hmm. so this is the plus there are two big minuses uh, one is that um, european parliament has no role so, okay, if we think about uh, democratic legitimacy, this is a bit of an issue. Mm? The second uh, is that we are always under an emergency mode. So, basically, and then if you throw the ball, you peer into the future, look at you know, the next stage with enlargement, the risk here would be that this uh, paralysis under normal circumstances in the decision making, cum emergency decision under Article 122 in case of major crisis. Not a great prospect and uh, probably not even uh, consistent with uh, the Jean Monnet dictum that we react, uh, the Euro, uh, Europe reacts during the crisis uh, mainly. So how do we avoid a permanent one-to-two -two regime? I'm Günther Wilms, I'm a former member of the Commission's Legal Service and I used to be legal advisor at the, at the Institute. Um, I would like to make two remarks, one more technical and one concerning the uh, paradox uh, between transfer of competences to the European Union and democracy. Provocatively, I don't see a paradox. Why? Because if you see the second leg of democracy that appeared after the Second World War that uh, Professor De Hoos was mentioning. Uh, this is what Abraham Lincoln, to look back even further in the past, called democracy for the people. Not, not government of the people, by the people. This is the representation, the, the voting, but as well for the people. And in a world that is more and more global, more and more globalized, more and more interconnected, national democracy does not help to have a better system of governance for the people. 
and the of the people and by the people is not necessarily a paradox either because the of the people and by the people is respected by a growing power of the European Parliament as an institution and the democratic, democratic legitimacy of the governments of the member states, of the, their representatives in council, if you want. And the perfect role that the parliament plays in the ordinary legislative procedure. So government for the people better on European level than on national level. That is the, to solve the paradox, if you want an idea. The second point is, concerns the observation that you made concerning the consensus, the growing consensus in the European Parliament. And I was wondering uh, whether this could be traced back to a, the growing importance of the so-called trilogues, where Parliament, Council and the Commission sit together relatively early in the legislative process and discuss first on technical level, and having participated in several of these meetings, I can tell you, it's uh, sometimes a, uh, what they call uh, la nuit de long, de long couteau, I think. Mm. And if you have it on political level, it, it takes uh, sometimes until two or three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And that prepares the, actually, the actual voting and maybe uh, helps to ease out problems that do not have necessarily to be dealt with by the legislator in the pleno and explains the higher level of consensus. Thank you. Okay, so you take the turn. After that, there'll be four more questions. We'll go a bit over time. Because we waited seven years to hear from you, there's a bit of build-up of interest. <laughs> we made a mistake. Um, but, so do take the floor as long as you like. Well, um, I'll be very quick. Uh, trilogues, yes, this is part of the system. Uh, but precisely, it's a good example of how the machinery helps uh, bringing apparently opposed uh, positions defended by different political parties or groups in uh, the parliament uh, clo somewhat closer uh, so that uh, they can be eventually supported by uh, the large majority in the European Parliament. So uh, I think that it illustrates my point that we have a formidable uh, machinery to reduce antagonism between opposed uh, positions, uh, be opposed positions amongst member states, opposed positions uh, amongst uh, party uh, groups or even national delegations in the European Parliament. So, um, Government for the people, yeah, uh, here I would say, paradox, um, I don't disagree with you, Günther, but uh, uh, I nonetheless see a paradox, which is not a theoretical paradox. It's, it's, a, it's a political paradox in the sense that not at the level of political theory, but uh, the paradox is simply how come that in the presence of uh, public opinions that were not minimally interested in uh, a transfer of authority to the European level and governments that were in their vast majority opposed to those, the dominant trend of the period has nonetheless been uh, uh, that I have described. And uh, yeah, you, you may justify it on theoretical grounds, but it nonetheless remains a, a political paradox, uh, according to me. And I think it's important to, uh, illustrate, well, let's say, to emphasize that point because uh, it may help us understand, uh, or it forces us to ask ourselves a question about the political dynamics uh, at work in this transfer of authority. Uh, and to Marco's question uh, there, I must say, yes, well, uh, that's uh, indeed the big question. How do we move from a system of, uh, uh, should I say, a, a government through crisis, a governance through crisis, to a more stable and peaceful uh, democratic uh, form of functioning? Uh, uh, all this uh, in the framework of uh, the present uh, treaties, uh, in the face of a further enlargement to the Union, well, the recipes for uh, accidents are, um, uh, occasions or rather for accidents are manifold, uh, we'll have to see uh, how uh, Europe manages to uh, 
basically overcome those hurdles, those many hurdles that you described, but they are there for sure. Yeah. Okay, my name is uh, Bettina de Souza Guilherme, and I'm from the European Parliament Economic and Monetary Committee, and I'm here as an EU fellow for a year. And um, I have two questions uh, concerning economic governance and, and democracy. Um, one is from me, and one is actually from my Director General, that he asked me, and I would like to ask it not only to you, but also to some of the uh, other researchers here. So uh, the first one was when uh, I looked at figures of trust uh, that uh, of the population in the EU. We saw uh, a, a strong fall after the financial crisis or during the financial crisis management. Huh? And, um, and uh, it was interesting even when at the lowest point of this trust, even the trust in the EU was higher than the trust in national political institutions like parties and other institutions. And I was always puzzled by that. And I want to ask you, do you think that the citizens understood that the, that, that, uh, the problems in the governance was caused actually by the national governments and by the more intergovernmental, intergovernmental way of governing the crisis in the financial crisis? And then the second question is more related than during the pandemic, uh, governance which was more successful and led to an increase in trust in the EU. And so my director general is basically now uh, responsible for internal policy, but he comes from the communication department. So he was interested to see if there's any research that shows an increase in an awareness or a feeling more as an EU citizen through a better uh, governance. Yeah? Uh, Simon Hicks, uh, Steinrock and Chair in uh, SPS here at the UI. There was one uh, development since 2002 that you didn't mention I was surprised about because it's one of the main things that I think scholars of the EU institutions have talked about, which is the rise of intergovernmentalism and decline of the community method. And I wondered what your thoughts are on how that trend, what does that mean for a debate about the democratic deficit? Because if Andy Moravchik were here, he would say Europeanization plus intergovernmentalism means we no longer need to care about the democratic deficit. Ah, um, okay. I think to you two questions, I can give one single answer, which is that we have here a wonderful data set, uh, which is uh, the result of surveys conducted by YouGov on the occasion of our State of the Union uh, conferences on solidarity uh, in Europe, and it's a gold mine. It's a gold mine because it shows that precisely citizens, well, uh, uh, citizen thinking about Europe evolves in reaction to uh, external uh, or even at times internal challenges, and uh, uh, they often recognize uh, the necessity for European action uh, to a degree uh, which is unparalleled uh, at the governmental level. Uh, the best example being uh, that of a European defense, where there is a strong, is it a demand? Is it uh, acceptance? I don't know. Uh, but uh, strong support for the idea, certainly. So yes, I think it, 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 uh, there is research on that topic. And if I remember well, this is something that uh, uh, we still are trying to further uh, develop. So uh, the interest of the European Parliament in that is very welcome. Um, now, Simon, I will resist <laughs> the temptation to, to answer because it, it will take us a long time <laughs> to address your question. Um, I simply say I, I find uh, um, to me, there is less of a paradox because I think that uh, there is less of a steady uh, transition towards intergovernmentalism that you find in much of the literature, uh, period. But I'm, I'm happy to discuss over lunch <laughs> because it, it requires really a, a very 
comprehensive survey of developments in many fields. Yeah, governments need to agree on, on those things. Uh, yeah, but look at where the inspiration comes from and look at what uh, they uh, decide ultimately. I mean, banking union is a good example. Of course, it was decided uh, uh, at uh, the European Council. Where else could it be decided? But then, you know, uh, who drafted uh, the, the various uh, pieces of uh, legislation that were then uh, enacted on the basis of the, the big uh, uh, decision of uh, the June uh, 2012 European Council? Well, I have the answer, uh, but I don't want to embarrass people by giving names. So, <laughs> uh, believe me, it, it was not only in government's hands, and it's just an example. But I think. Uh, George Papa Constantino, professor at the School of International Governance of the Institute. Two connected questions, or no, after thanking you for your thoughts. The first one has to do with the locus of the discussion of democratic deficit and the national versus EU level, it's almost too easy to ascribe all the democratic deficit at the, at the EU level. But if we wanted to be slightly heretic and maybe more uh, kind of true to ourselves, I wonder if the, the real problem in many of our countries is not at the national level, we're simply projecting it at the European level. So a thought on that. That's the first question. The second question has to do with the uh, referenda or referendums, however you want to say it, as a, as a response uh, to the democratic deficit. We've had some disastrous uh, uh, cases. The UK is one, Greece is another. Um, and I wonder a few words, if you had, on that, and mm. whether you would inscribe uh, the use of a referendum in the inventiveness uh, at the EU level that we sh one should one should. Uh, adopt, as in uh, Eve's 2002 uh, paper. Well, uh, Renaud, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for your two generous comments on my 2002 uh, lecture. Uh, one of my favorite quotations is one by Giovanni Sartori, who wrote, democracy is a pompous word for something which does not exist. And actually, Sartori wanted to underline that pure democracy in the, uh, let's say, a pure sense of the word, indeed, is unapplicable, even in Greece in the fifth century before Christ. Uh, but democracy is also an extremely opportunistic ideology or, or regime. The two main adversaries of democracy over time have been the liberal thinking, the liberal South, which were afraid, which were, uh, which were fearing the mob, and later on, the socialists, because they were so disappointed with the poor results of the emerging representative systems in the 19th century. And what is extraordinary is that democratic systems have incorporated both the liberal thinking in the form of checks and balances, uh, <clears throat> division of powers, etc., and socialism in the form of the welfare state. So it was not the socialist revolution, but it was the welfare state and is probably more Im important. So the democracy has this extraordinary capacity to in integrate some elements which seem absolutely in contradiction with the initial meaning of what democracy is. Mm -hmm. So to address your question <coughs> um, about referendum and, and di direct democracy, I'm not very uh, fond of direct democracy because we know all the risk of, uh, of introducing referenda, especially if uh, the question is a, a $1 million question that you have to answer by yes or no. 
but it would be possible to innovate. For instance, I have always thought that if on the day of the parliamentary election, they were on the ballot next to the vote for the members of the parliament, one or two proposals put forward by the EU institutions or by any other mechanism on which the people could vote, it would be, it would have several positive effects. The, mm. first, of, the, the first one would be to give the people the impression that they are not counting for nothing. Mm. From time to time, we ask for their opinion. And secondly, it would have certainly, or oh, certainly, it would have probably a major, major effect on political participation. For the time being, I have to say that the so-called constitutional part, the constitution, constitutional leg, is so well developed that the European Union, in my view, is by far the most democratic system in the world. But if you consider the popular leg, well, the leg is quite meager and insufficiently developed, and the innovations proposed by the Lisbon Treaty, for instance, are at the limit of the ridiculous. They don't work. They are useless. And they give the people the impression, the right impression, that they have been fooled. So there is probably a way in between, let's say, the nothing or the too little, and, uh, and be crea creative without uh, risking to rock the boat because referendum uh, in the usual way could indeed rock the boat and it's not uh, certainly what I would wish. But thanks again. And uh, just a last word perhaps, since we are also celebrating the 30 years of the Robert Schumann Center, well, the baby has grown up a lot uh, and uh, I think it has been uh, an extraordinary uh, innovation within the European University Institute which has, has changed so much over 50 years time thanks to the contribution of so many people and uh, so I can't say that I wish to be there in 30 years because uh, it's probably it would be pure wishful thinking but uh, good luck for the future. <clears throat> Well, it's difficult to speak after, after Eve. Um, let me say this, um, but really putting uh, my feet in, uh, uh, in his footsteps. Um, I know that direct democracy is fashionable, and uh, I, I do think that indeed inventiveness is uh, absolutely required, but that said, I will be extremely, extremely cautious uh, in uh, um, the use of referendums in relation to European things. Why? Well, this can be explained uh, in very simple terms. The essence of the EU system is decision by consensus, which is an anti-majoritarian system, right? You need more than a simple majority or even an absolute majority for a decision to be. You need a large majority, uh, not, in, not only qualified, uh, possibly uh, uh, very often, as you could see, uh, uh, one tries to go well beyond the qualified majority. The referendum is just the opposite. It's, uh, it's based on the idea that you can give a, uh, a simple majoritarian answer to any question. Uh, and simply say it, you might argue that for that reason it is almost incompatible with uh, the essence of the EU system as it is uh, constructed, at least for the time being. And certainly on uh, complex constitutional issues as we could witness. I mean, uh, it's, I think, a fallacy to think that uh, you can give simple answers, yes or no, to complex questions. It's often yes, but uh, 
uh, at certain conditions, provided certain uh, conditions are met, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, what is attractive in the referendum is its simplicity, but it's uh, actually extreme. It makes it a very dangerous instrument to use, and uh, we all have examples uh, to illustrate that point, which is not to say that we cannot find uh, wise uh, uses to be made on well-circumscribed questions uh, of that instrument. Uh, but uh, I think we need to, to, to think critically about the potential of that instrument before opening the door to uh, uh, its uh, widespread use on the European plane. Um, which is not to say that, uh, I mean, referendums are one thing. Direct democracy has other instruments uh, that, that can be explored and, as Calypso pointed out, are usefully explored uh, by the EU itself and, and incidentally, uh, by people here at the Institute. So uh, one can sort of uh, try to, I mean, that's a big uh, and interesting uh, question for the future. Can we identify? Uh, let's say, the, the principles that uh, we would recommend uh, to adopt concerning the use of referendums uh, at European level in relation to European uh, issues and so on and so forth. Uh, I think here uh, there is a, a nice research uh, question with uh, you know, interesting policy implication, Mr. Director. Uh, maybe this could be considered by uh, uh, members of your team. That will be my conclusion for today. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and I want to thank all of you uh, for contributing to what are really wonderful, ongoing and important discussions that we can have. Uh, some are on YouTube still. I will encourage you to answer some of the questions that are waiting there for you. But we now have cocktails. And um, I just want to say, I think there's a wonderful convention you may have begun of, of presidents com commenting on other presidents' work. But we won't wait two decades for the commentary on your paper tonight. And thank you very much, Professor De Hoos, for telling us what you're working on. Thank you. Thank you.